So let me tell you, I'm going to welcome my uh, Press 53 compadres as they are, Felicia and Terry. Let me tell you a little bit about them, and then I'm going to let them do what they do. Um, Terry Erickson is the author of four books of poetry. Her work has appeared in American Life in Poetry, The Christian Science Monitor, Verse Daily, and the North Carolina Literary Review, among others. She's won a Nautilus Silver Award for Poetry, a Gold Medal for Poetry in the Next Generation Indie Book Awards, and she was a finalist in the International Book Awards for Poetry. Felicia Mitchell comes to us from Washington County, Virginia. She teaches English at Emory and Henry College. She's published in Blue Fifth Review, The Dead Mule School of Southern Literature, Southern Women's Review, and others. And let's give a good welcome to Terry and Felicia. To a wonderful short story writer. If anybody's ever read any of Stephen Mitchell's work, he's fabulous. So. <laughs> so we decided to do something a little different tonight. Um, Felicia and I are, are good friends and uh, we're each other's fans and friends. And so we're going to sort of do a, a call and response kind of poetry experience. Um, Felicia picked out a number of poems, and then I picked out poems that I thought um, sort of spoke to those poems. So that's what we'll be doing this evening. So, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. So, and I'm going to start with a poem called Near Penland. Can you hear? Can you hear? Can you hear? You hear okay? Near the job. Okay, near Penland. Okay. Near Penland. After the memorial service, we buried a salamander instead, Sylvie picking it up with a leaf after I spotted it in the road with its brains oozing out. We didn't really bury it. We tossed it into some Queen Anne's lace on the side of the winding road on the side of the mountain. Anything more would have been obvious. It was a bright red, the red of Valentine's. It was as plump as a pair of lips. It was the red of Jesus' word in a Bible. You get my drift. It was so red, it was almost still alive. Farther down the road, we saw a snake turning into asphalt, a gray snake ghost of its former black snake self. It was past saving. I took a picture of this dead snake. Sylvie took her jacket off in the rain. This poem is called Empathy, and it's actually dedicated to Felicia. Um, you know how it is when you have a friend that's sort of an acquaintance friend that you think a lot of, and then all of a sudden, um, sometimes you realize that this person is going to be a lot more to you than that. Um, we had this kind of moment uh, up in Virginia where I knew that she was going to be a sister friend. And that's what this poem is about, and it's a celebration of female friendship. So it's called Empathy for Felicia. Close as two women crooning into the same microphone, they sing their sorrows to one another in a grocery store parking lot, keys dangling from their hands, Cars waiting still and silent as good dogs beside them. People pass by unnoticed. The sky grows dark. On and on they stand, rooted to the pavement, sharing sadness like a loaf of warm bread. Eyes luminous as pearls formed by her friend's suffering. Perhaps the stars will wish on them tonight. For even as they part, briefly touching, their glow is brighter, the ground lit beneath their feet as they walk away, each wearing the other woman's shoes. I feel like I just want to talk about that poem also. <laughs> yeah, oh, but I will read. I met Terry, the... Right when I found out I had cancer, she came into my life. It was 
pretty special. And um, this is so now, let's shift gears. This is a poem called Watery Swamp. It's a place I went to a good bit when I was very small. And um, with my family, I remember how we left Mama on a bedspread at the edge of the swamp, nine months pregnant, with fried chicken to eat and a shotgun to protect her from bears, Daddy said. Bears meaning danger. And she would have shot the gun, too, at a bear or a man or a renegade duck, at anything that threatened her or the child swimming inside her, while the other children and her husband navigated a boat around cypress stumps and looked for reflections in the water. I remember that afternoon as easily as I remember all our stories and hold them as close to as that shotgun Mama held, or us, ready to pull them out when I need them to protect me from the idea that one day, someday, Nobody will know we left Mama on a bedspread at the edge of a swamp, nine months pregnant, eating fried chicken, while her family disappeared into black water. Except now everybody who reads that poem is going to know. This poem is called Loretta Ray, and this is a poem about my mother. Um, this is to me is a is a poignant work just because I know that my mother was, was okay. It's just that I know that my mother was headed toward a loss and a lot of difficulty in her life. So this poem is about a time in her life before these difficult things happened. Um, Loretta Ray, my mother, lipstick red, barefoot, toenails painted the palest shade of pink, stretched out her dancer's legs and rubbed suntan lotion into a face that should have been magnified on a movie screen. The kind that bowled men over, even with curlers in her hair, and children dangling from both hands wherever she went. They never saw the greasy chaise lounge behind our house, where the sun whispered sonnets in her ears and darkened her skin with hot kisses while the radio played blue velvet and the green grocer and the mailman and the gas station attendants and the jean-clad teenage boys loitering downtown on Saturday afternoons who caught glimpses of Loretta Ray every now and then, if they were lucky, would have dropped dead with desire if they'd seen her sunning herself in our backyard wearing nothing but a two-piece bathing suit and a lazy sun-drenched grin the best years of her life, almost, but not quite, passed. This poem is about my father, sort of. It's called Stone Mountain. And it's the Stone Mountain in North Carolina. There are many Stone Mountains. I know my father could have told me who I sought. Let me start over. I know my father could have told me why sap rises and why it seeps out of trees sticky on my fingers when I touch them, or why a gunshot across a valley is always louder when you walk alone. But he isn't here right now, and I am. A creek's whispers all I have to go on. And so I listen to what it has to say about sap and beetles and solitude and everything else I wonder about as I wander along this trail, miles to go, my father's walking stick firm in my hand. And this poem is about my father, and it's called Night Watchman. Our father wearing cotton pajama bottoms and a white t-shirt, the thin, comfortable kind with a few holes here and there for ventilation, made the rounds at night, locking all the doors, turning out the lights. We could hear him from our beds upstairs if we were still awake, picture his familiar face striped with shadows from trees next to the windows as the moon rose high in the sky and the street lamp burned bright on the corner. 
It was he and he alone who stood between whatever it was that lurked in the dark woods, the deserted roads, and his family. But since it was our father watching over us like a sentry, we slept secure, certain he would keep us safe from harm. This is a poem I wrote after I went swimming. It's called Revelation at Philpot Lake. I don't think the soul leaves the body. It has to be the other way around. The way a berry leaves its bramble or a bird leaves its nest. It has to feel a little like I feel after I swim and I leave the water, my arms leaving a whole lake behind. What if the body leaves the soul to give the soul more room to wander? What if the soul is thankful? hovering, a dragonfly over water. I love that image. I like the dragonfly like over water. Yes, yeah, yeah. so I love dragonflies. Yeah. Um, the poem I chose is called Clean Peaches. And uh, I've said this before, but this is actually the only poem that I don't own myself because it was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association and they insist on owning all of their pieces, their poems, their whatever. So I had to get permission from them to put this poem in my book, which was very strange. Um, and also it's not, it's one, well I like to say that my, all my poems are real and not all of them are true. And this is a real poem, but it's not a true poem because my husband is sitting like right over there. So you'll see what I mean when I read it. Clean Peaches. I'm sitting by your hospital bed the morning after we almost lost you feeding you canned peaches with a plastic spoon. You seldom speak, with cancer ravaging your fine mind like a plague of hungry locusts. But you seem more yourself today than you have in weeks. Your gaze is tender as a bruise, and my hand trembles lifting the spoon to your mouth. Your recent rousing performance of husband dying has ripped the rose-colored glasses right off my face. You aren't going to get well after all, despite our murmured prayers and midnight promises to be good forever, if only. How like you, though, to hold a dress rehearsal, eyes shut, your linen head crushing the pillow, sheets bunched like drifts of snow, covering your too still body. It became real for me then, your death. I wanted to tie you to the bed rails, stand guard with a flaming sword, daring anyone, anything, to try and take you. Instead, I feed you clean peaches, letting go of you a little more, my darling, with every bite. I've always written about my son, my whole life, his whole life. <laughs> this is a poem about my son as an adult. There are poems in the book about him as a, a little fellow, but this is one about him as a, a grown man, and it's called What My Son Sees. I guess I should preface this and say my son's an ultra runner. He runs long and far. What My Son Sees. Toward the end of a long run, my son sees things, his journey, his imagination. One time, he says, he saw a parrot somewhere near Bedford. He has also seen dancing bears, black bears dancing on the Appalachian Trail, not echoes of grateful dead bears tiptoeing through a forest, but real bears, albeit imaginary. My son has seen real live bears and wild orchids too. He has seen the sunrise and the nightfall and a moon so big it was a boulder he had to clamber over. He has run so far and so fast 
his feet separated from his mind, his mind watching his body the way I used to watch him when he was small. Last time he ran a hundred miles, he said, he saw his father smoking a pipe. His father was standing on the edge of Kusa Trail, his arms crossed, looking the way he always looks. And then, as he kept running, my son ran into the arms of a tree, and the tree hugged him, not vice versa, holding him with its arms. Later, we said, both his father and I, on separate occasions, not knowing what the other said, the tree was hugging you. That's why he needs our son, deep in a forest, sleep deprived, running and running, until he thinks he can run no more. Parents who believe in him, and a tree that cradles him, until all the wild horses gallop by, one by one, their hooves a heart beating. So let me say too about this poem. I wrote this poem because, because Terry said, you need another poem with a horse in it. And I thought, how in the world will I write another poem with a horse in it? And then one day, I did. Yes. Yeah, so that was thanks to Terry and her, her homework assignment. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's lovely. And it's so nice you have the subject here to read it to. That's wow. right, yeah. <laughs> uh, so. That happens with my daughter sometimes, too. So I wrote a poem about my daughter. So often people in our lives find their ways, their uh, way into our poems. So uh, my daughter and I are very different people. Um, I saw her when she was born, so I know she's my child. But um, <laughs> other than that, I would question probably. I mean, she's she's a true flower child. She should have been in a in a van with the flowers and the whole thing in the '60s and barefoot and all of that, and she's got a tattoo and a tongue ring and all that stuff. And you look at me, I'm dressed like the Queen of England, you know, so. I mean, it's just really funny. I remember when she got the tongue ring, I was so horror-stricken, and I just told her, I said, that looks like a beetle sitting on your tongue, you know, so. Um, but I have, you know, we love each other and we accept each other's, you know, ways and um, my daughter is lovely. So, um, anyway, this is for my daughter. It's called Flower Child. Flower Child, where did you come from? Your hands are bigger than mine, stronger. They are seldom still. Digging in the dirt, stringing beads on the necklace, snapping your fingers to a beetle song. You are always moving forward, dragging the past behind you like a streamer. You are happier barefoot, dancing in the grass, than women wearing designer shoes, jumping in a pile of money. Pierced and tattooed, silver bracelets jingling, you are as different from me as north is to south. Yet wherever you go, my heart, like the needle on a compass, follows. This next poem is called It's called Near Eve. I know what it's called. <laughs> I hike, obviously, you know, I hike a lot too, and I spend a whole lot of time in the woods, and I used to have this ritual when I first started hiking by myself that I would always take an apple and eat it and then just throw the core, unless, you know, you're not supposed to. Please stop, but that was my ritual, so that's what this poem is sort of about, but not really. Near E. Sometimes I'm higher than a hawk. Sometimes the hawks are higher, circling me while I eat an apple, alone on a rocky summit near trees. And beetles click and clack over my shoulders, like Adam would if he were here, chiding. Don't throw that core off the cliff. I so admire Felicia for hiking and her son for running. My idea of exercise is a rapid eye movement and sleep. So if I did any of the exercise that they did, I'd probably have to have my own oxygen tank on my shoulder. Although I could work up to it, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 
So anyway, the poem that I chose to correspond with that one is called Bluebird. Light as crumbs on a plate, a bluebird perched on the porch railing, cocking its head this way and that, feathers the indigo blue of a king's hand-dyed robe, or the sky on its bluest day, drained of clouds and concentrated in the bottom of God's drinking glass, which he swirled and swallowed, then breathed out this little bird now flying. So here we have the last poem I'm going to read is called A Day Without a Poem, and here it goes. Let's see, A Day Without a Poem. On a day without a poem, there is no need for meter, just the beat of a heart or two for good measure. And instead of rhyme, one bird can call after another. On a day without a poem, there is no imagery. The sky is blue. The clouds are clowns. On a day without a poem, there is no journey motif, only a journey up and over rocks and through woods and meadows. Climbing to the top of a mountain is no different from climbing to the top of a mountain. Nothing like climbing Mount Purgatory to, to catch a glimpse of Paradiso. You are not a poet. The man you are with is not a poet. You are just two people on a hike. Hobble bush flowers on a mossy ground. On the top of the mountain are white like white flowers. The moss is mossy is moss. There is no symbolism. When it is time to turn around, it is time to turn back and walk until you pause to waltz with wild horses without music without rhythm in a field of wildflowers. Perhaps words need stanzas, no more than horses need pens or dancers need a dance floor. On a day without a poem, when there is a full moon waiting at the end of the trail, punctuation is superfluous. This day does not need a title, although it is as tempting to give it one as it is to press a violet or a whole mountain of a day between the pages of a book. You know, I'm an English teacher and, and I think this poem is about that as much as it is about many other things and, and how I think, you know, we, we teach one thing but we also realize that I guess I'm losing my train of thought here because my son is sitting right here. But I think that one thing I try to do with language is to, to say something that I don't think language can do. And so I'll just shut up now. That made perfect sense. Yeah, that made perfect yes, sense. Yes, it made yeah. perfect sense. You and so, of course, you know, I was teaching Inferno around the time that I wrote that poem. So here, here's Terry. Yeah, that, that made complete and utter sense. Thank you. So now, like, the poem I was going to read, I can't even find it. Oh, well, that's all right. I can, I can <laughs> lecture some more while you're okay, okay. okay. There we go. See, I put it on these pages now that I'm older, and the, the, you never know what lighting is going to be in a place that you're reading, so I don't want to be, you know, going like this. So, see, I printed in very bold print. Um, anyway, this particular poem is called, An Old Woman Looks Out the Window on Christmas Morning. And I chose this one because, again, it's something where words are not necessary. Um, her husband calls it snow, a word she doesn't remember, but it feels good in her mouth, that word. Creamy, in fact, with bits of bark and earth crumbled into it, and holly berries. And it is cold, so cold, she can feel it through the glass. Yet her husband's breath is warm. And he is smiling, as if there are no glowering clouds, and the road is not impassable beneath this glaring whiteness. The grandchildren will be here soon, he says, whoever they are. And then she forgets everything, he said, because this moment is all she has, and the next moment comes with no memory of the one before. So she asks again and again, what is it? Until at last he tells her, it's Christmas, darling, Christmas, 
and takes her into his arms where she doesn't care anymore about words. Well, does anybody have any questions or comments or dancing or whatever you want to do? <laughs> any questions at all? We'd like one question. Yeah, even one. One question. What are your favorite colors? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's Monty Python esque. <laughs> 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 blue. I really like blue. And also yellow, which happened to be the Swedish colors. And my husband is Swedish, so it's just complete coincidence. But, uh, or at least his, his uh, ancestors are in Sweden. I like orange. And I like pink, purple, black. But I especially like orange. Yeah. yeah. I don't think color. I've ever seen you wear orange. When I hike, I wear a lot of orange. Oh, no wonder. <laughs> I've never seen you yeah, doing that. And, so and, right, and right now I'm making another shawl like this one that's a, a rust orange. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, she does several things that I have great admiration for. Like she made this item here. Like my fingers would all like break off into the floor if I tried to do that. <laughs> a woman actually tried to teach me how to crochet. and She said she could teach anyone how to crochet. I ruined her record. <laughs> <laughs> ruined it. Yeah. It was a sad, I made a little square of sadness. <laughs> it was really awful. Yeah, I did. No, but my daughter, again, my daughter can crochet and knit very beautifully. So, yeah, so colors. Anything else? How early in your life did you start writing poetry? I started writing poems as soon as I knew how to write. So I was probably. Well, the first poem I wrote, I was not quite seven because it was a Christmas <coughs> present from my great aunt Nell, and it was a poem called The Cave Pearl that I wrote for her. And I remember walking up to her and saying, Here, I wrote you a poem. Later in life, I thought, Why didn't I write my first poem for my parent, Mama? <laughs> or Teddy? What? Anyway. It's probably too been, close. Yeah, I've been right, but I, I made up for it so, over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I started writing when I was 10 in my fifth grade class at Little Old Brunson Elementary School. Uh, I had a, a very overachieving first year uh, teacher and uh, she actually comes to my book launch parties now which is wonderful. The first time I saw her in the audience, you know, I recognized her immediately. Uh, she looked uh, just the same almost because she's only like 10 years older than me. Which is nothing when you get to be in this age, you know. So, but it was everything between between ten and twenty-one. That's a big gap, you know. So she introduced us to all the arts, um, poetry. Uh, we did um, Macbeth, the play, and I played Lady Macbeth in the fifth grade. So I got to use profanity in front of the TA. It was really terrific. And uh, it was a condensed version, but I actually tried out for the witch because I love that whole cauldron thing. And uh, she said, oh, no, you're going to try out for the lead, you know. And that was my debut and finale on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think I did a good job. But I started writing them, and I, I wrote sort of uh, clandestinely. Um, I was an English major in college, mm -hmm. and I've always worked with words. I, I was a radio copywriter. I've worked in, um, at our newspaper, the Winston-Salem Journal. I uh, was a um, technical medical editor for a long time. It just goes hand in hand with poetry, right? <laughs> and so I always worked with words, but um, I was a secret poet until I was 45 years old. And then I decided that I wanted to pursue being published. And uh, now I have published four books, so I've really been so fortunate to achieve my dream. And so it's never too late to be the person you wanted to be. Or too early, I tell students that too. They don't know how old you are when you, you know, submit to a literary journal. You know, you don't have to send your license picture along with it. So it can be any age. They're looking for good work. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Did either of you have a favorite poet that guided your writing when you were young, or favorite poets? When I was very young, I had these books that were my father's anthologies of the world's greatest poems, these little tiny red books, and the greatest poems as of 1945 or thereabouts. And so 
the favorite poems that I remember from very early, early, like when I was a little girl, were by Sappho and Edward Thomas, and I could almost recite those. And they're odd choices for a child. And then Sarah Teasdale. I like Sarah Teasdale too. And so that's where I grew up reading his poems. We didn't have so many children's books, but those were children's books because they were little and read. And so. Those are the very early favorites. After that, you know, I read, you read widely, and I don't like to have favorites now. I like to like everybody. Uh, I love Terry's poem. Yeah, I like Felicia's poem. That's right. But, um, yeah, but I, I still go back and reread Sappho's poems, and Edward Thomas, you know, what can I say? Yeah, well, um, we had one book of poetry in my house growing up, and it was by Robert Frost. And uh, you can just tell I write exactly like it, right? So, I mean, I, I took no lessons in that as far as the kind of poetry that I write, but, um, you know, I did read some poetry. And we have a lot of children's books in my house, and so I read Dr. Zeus, which I think is very poetic. And, uh, but, you know, not much, you know, my father was more like an athletic sort, you know, he played softball and golf and... Yeah, he was a yeah. poet, you know. So we did not really have that influence in the house. You know, education was important, but, you know, neither of my parents read poetry. So, you know, it was lovely to have that one book, you know, to read. And then whatever I studied in school. And later, I just like whoever moves me, you know, whatever strikes my heart, which is what poetry can do so beautifully. You know, it just goes right to the to your soul and the bone, you yeah, know, yeah. and it's just like an arrow. And when I read something like that, um, it seems quite miraculous. And, mm -hmm. you know, I love that poetry. I love uh, Ted Kuzer. I don't know if you're familiar with his work. He was U.S. Poet Laureate for several years, and uh, I love his imagery. And, um, you know, he says a lot in a few words. Yeah. Which is really what we try to do, you know, you might start out with this really incredibly long poem and then you just trim and trim and trim, which is what I like. I like the in and out and the vignette nature of the narrative of the poem. And I, um, I do, I, I also like something even more stripped down sometimes mm -hmm. in what I try to write or what I try to maybe try to read. I like and the St. Vincent Millay, oh, yeah. and I like Yehuda Amakai, he's one of my all-time favorite poets, mm -hmm. and there I just, uh, and so often for me it's a poem, I find a poem mm -hmm. that I like so much, and I return to the poem more than to the poet. Yes, exactly, so, I think that's what I was trying to say, you said yeah. it better. 